Um, I want to welcome you all to the 33rd annual conference of the Literary Managers and Dramaturgs. My name is Ken Trenilia, and I'm president of LMDA for three more days. <laughs> About a year and a half ago, as uh, I was mad scrambling, um, preparing for last year's conference in Berkeley, California, with our amazing uh, VP conferences, Coriana Moffitt, um, I got uh, an offer out of the blue from our then uh, VP of regional activity, Joanna Falk, to host the next conference uh, here in Toronto, bringing the conference back to Canada after five years, uh, when it was previously in Vancouver, but back here to Toronto after 11 years. Um, and I immediately said like, yes please. Uh, we're a volunteer run organization and it's a heck of a lot of work to uh, run the organization, but also particularly to plan a conference. Um, and so I just, I'm gonna say thank you many times, but I wanna start off the conference by saying, Thank you to Joanna and Joseph and Coriana and everyone else who's uh, uh, contributed to the running of this conference and particularly to our a robust group of volunteers um, who are just taking care of everything that the rest of us don't see. And so please extend your thanks to them um, soon and often uh, throughout the conference because that's also a lot of hard work. So we can be here and gather and be open. Um, I like to say that uh, our two greatest assets uh, at LMDA um, are uh, our nimbleness as, a, as an intimate organization um, and the relationships that we develop in the network that we have. Um, and so here I want to uh, encourage everyone um, to get to know the rest of the people in the room. You know, just make a commitment every day to introduce yourself to three new people and get to know who they are and what they do. <laughs> Um, we've been able in our, in our uh, small but mighty uh, membership to uh, do a lot of pretty great things um, in the field, and I think that's what we have to offer. So, without further ado, I would like to um, welcome to the stage our conference chair, Joanna Falk. <laughs> Joanna Falk. I am the literary manager at the Tarragon Theatre here in Toronto, and yes, I am the conference chair. I'm so pleased to, ooh, I'm doing that with my mind. Uh, I'm so happy to see you all here. Welcome to Toronto. Um, how many people is your first time in Toronto? Oh my gosh. Okay, I just want to give you a quick pronunciation lesson. I know it looks like it's pronounced Toronto. None of us say Toronto. We all say Toronto. So it's T-R-O-N-N-O, -N -N -O, Toronto. If you want to blend in, if you don't want to look like... Because always in movies when they're like, I am from Toronto. No, you're not. <laughs> um, so it's a, big, it's, it's a big day, not just because the LMJ conference is starting today. It's also um, National Indigenous Peoples Day. Yay! Yay! to the Canada Council and the Toronto Arts Council for supporting our conference. It means a lot, it helps a lot. Um, and of course, again, thank you to the volunteers. Um, if you have any questions about where to go, what to do, where to go, what, where to eat lunch, where to get a coffee, where the US Embassy is, <laughs> we can, we want to, um, I, I won't go there. Uh, <laughs> our, our, our delightful conference coordinator, Joseph, has created a fantastic interactive map. If you haven't already looked at it um, online as part of your conference handbook, he's, he's mapped out every possible thing you might want to know about in the area. Um, oh, and Wi-Fi. Does everyone know that the Wi-Fi password is on the back of your... I know. I know. Yeah. We thought of pretty much everything, hopefully. Um, and you should only have to log in once, but if not, then it's right there. And all the addresses of all of your uh, hotel, the pub, it's, it's Brian Ford's local. So if you have any questions about what beers they have on tap, Brian will be the person to tell you that. 
Um, just to tell you a little bit about the setup of the conference. So this whole floor is ours. There's not going to be anyone else up here. As you may have noticed, there's only two rooms, seemingly at the moment. But through the magic of technology, a wall will be created, ironically, um, <laughs> in between sessions. So this, so this will be called session room one. This will be called session room two. And in the back is session room three, which is mostly where the sort of um, academic papers are being presented. Um, there's schedules posted on each of the doors. Um, but if you have any questions about where you're supposed to be, again, ask a volunteer. Um, uh, the theme, crossing borders. Um, I thought of that theme a year ago when I was in Berkeley. Um, and it still is a theme that obviously continues to resonate. Um, I didn't add a colon descriptor of what I meant by crossing borders because I wanted you all to interpret it the way you thought about crossing borders and what borders you may be crossing in your life, in your work, as dramaturgs, as literary managers. Um, when I thought about crossing borders, for me, I've been a member of LMDA for uh, 20 years or so. And uh, what I've really loved about it is um, going to the US and learning a lot about what Americans are doing, because it's quite different from what we all are doing. So um, I really wanted to encourage folks to think about what borders they're crossing and when, especially when our American colleagues are coming here to Canada um, to really engage with us about what we do here. We may all kind of look the same as you, but we have, it's a whole other country. And uh, we have a different theatrical culture. Um, we think differently about things maybe than you do sometimes. Um, but I think there's great value in that. And I really encourage all of you to go to sessions that aren't about your own country, that aren't about things you already know about. Buy a Canadian play if you've never read one. See a Canadian play if you've never seen one while you're here. There's plenty of them going on. And uh, talk to some folks that are from a place that you're not. I'm going to do that. And please talk to me. <laughs> um, anything else? Uh, is there anything else, Coriana? You're good. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, so um, just as a, as, a, as a reminder about where we are right now, I'm going to ask Phelan Johnson to come up and um, do a land acknowledgement for us. Phelan. Hi. Yeah, I guess. I guess why not? It's here, right? I should yes. use it. Um, so my name is Phelan Johnson. I am Mohawk and Tuscarora from Six Nations Reserve. That's where my people are settled now, but that is not always where we were settled. Uh, I'm a playwright and a dramaturge and a director, heading in all of those directions, mostly a playwright, uh, and a podcaster now. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Uh, it's amazing how those things uh, feed into each other, but we'll talk more about that later. Um, so the land that we are on now uh, is the traditional land of many indigenous nations. And so uh, I know we have some cousins from the south here today. Um, and so indigenous First Nations, Native American, Native American Indian, all of those terms um, sort of encompass that. Um, and so on this day, it feels uh, really important to acknowledge um, our history. But not just today, I think on every day we need to acknowledge uh, the land that we stand on. Uh, and the land that we stand on is not just about um, it being indigenous land. Uh, it's about the land that we all stand on and stewardship and how we are all in responsible for this land. Um, a few months ago, I had the opportunity to go over to uh, the UK and it was a really complex thing for me because I didn't know how to be on someone else's land. It was the first time that I was in sort of really aware of the fact that I was going to be standing on someone else's land and so I had to think a lot about what that would be like for me as an indigenous person going over to the place where all of the papers were signed and all of the policy was made. And so um, that was a big light bulb moment for me in how I thought about that. Um, and so what I thought was when I go over, I will try and be a good guest. I will be polite. I will put my garbage where it goes uh, and I will walk softly. And so I think it's important that no matter where you come from and no matter how long your people may have been on this land that we all walk softly and take care of where we are. So this territory uh, has been host to many different nations. Um, how many people here are familiar with land acknowledgements? Damn, <laughs> that's great. Um, my land acknowledgements are a little bit different than you might hear. Um, one, I try not to read them off a phone or a piece of paper. Two, here at this dramaturgical conference, I wanted to give you a little bit of historical context as to where we are now. So Toronto is uh, on Lake Ontario, which is just down that way, right? Yes. I've never been in this building. And so 
that makes it part of the Great Lakes system. The Great Lakes system meant that there were a lot of nations traveling in and out of this area for thousands and thousands of years. There was trade, uh, there was intermarriage, uh, there was war, and so that means there were a lot of nations intermingling. And some of those nations you may hear about are called the Haudenosaunee, sometimes called the Six Nations, or the Iroquois. Those are my people, so they were in and out of this area. Uh, also the Wendat, sometimes called the Huron. The Huron is sort of a term that has fallen out of favor now uh, and is frequently considered derogatory, so I sort of try and steer people away from that terminology. Uh, and then the Anishinaabe, or Ojibwe, as you may hear them called, most specifically and most recently, the Mississaugas of the New Credit, who were the nation who negotiated the Toronto Purchase with the Crown. Mm -hmm. So that's how that all works. Um, when we did the when the when the Mississaugas of the New Credit did their negotiation, uh, they did ask to retain some of the waterways for fishing and hunting, as well as the Toronto Islands, which were still kind of in dispute. A lot of people from Mississauga who now live right next door to my people say that they never gave up that piece of land because it was considered sacred. Um, so I, I just want to put those, those sort of research things into your head and give you a bit of context about where we are. We are very close to the waterfront, which also means, is, you know, always means ceremony, always means trade routes. Uh, I ask you, if you're a visitor or if you are settled here in this area, when you walk through the city today, to take into consideration things that you might not necessarily consider as monuments or landmarks. Um, things like the Don Valley, which is very close to us, things like the, the waterfront. Um, all of these things, these are monuments in our country and they are much older than any of the highways or roadways we have. Mm -hmm. Things like Young Street, built over one of the oldest indigenous trails in the country, things like Davenport Road. All of those places have history and historical significance. And I invite you to think about where your feet land as you walk through the city today. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, and uh, if you want to know a little more about Toronto's his Indigenous history, there is still time to sign up for the First Story bus tour. It's happening tomorrow from 2 to 5. Uh, it's it's going to take you uh, through, uh, it's a bus tour that gonna, it's going to sort of go east in Toronto and talk about um, the Indigenous history of the land. Um, so if you want to sign up for that, there's still time. Um, so uh, being a conference chair is great because I get to invite folks to talk to you all that I love. And uh, so our first session um, is about, uh, 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 <laughs> features three gals who do this amazing podcast called The Secret Life of Canada. Um, if you haven't listened to it yet, it's this incredible podcast that I think dramaturges Canada. I am Canadian. I was born and raised here. I, uh, you know, did my history lessons. But um, once I started listening to their podcast, I realized I really hardly knew anything <laughs> about Canada and what I, th what I perceive as Canada is not maybe the Canada that uh, we are. Uh, the first uh, episode I listened to was about Banff, a beautiful spot that maybe some of you have spent some time in. And uh, uh, I learned a lot about the history of Banff, um, but in a way that um, was, uh, on the one hand, made me feel uh, bad that I didn't already know this, but Phelan and Leah, who are the hosts of the uh, podcast, are so great and charming and funny and, um, remind me that it's okay that um, Canada's history is not perfect and uh, that it's useful and great to know uh, as much as I can about uh, this country. So I'm gonna ask um, Phelan and Leah Simone Bowen and their research assistant, Erin uh, Brandenburg, to come up and um, they're gonna chat about their podcast and the secret life of Canada. Come on up. research assistant on some of the episodes. So this is like deep, deep, deep background. I'm, I'm more here than a huge fan and like. That's better. She helps us out a lot, <laughs> a lot. <laughs> um, so The Secret Life of Canada mm -hmm. is a podcast. It was one of the top podcasts in 2017 on multiple publications lists. Um, tell us about your podcast. Yeah, um, so the podcast, Phil and I decided to start this podcast uh, last year. It was Canada 150, 
uh, a big celebration of um, Canada essentially becoming a country. I'm using air quotes. <laughs> and um, so during Canada 150, a huge amount of funding um, in the Canadian art sector and the Canadian government went to telling stories of Canada. And we would meet periodically. We meet, we're both playwrights. We do a lot of um, writing uh, that, that works in history. And we would meet often and just talk about wow, I can't believe this weird thing got funding. And <laughs> why are they telling this story again? And it was the same stories. We hear the same stories throughout our, our um, education. Um, and those are usually the War of 1812, which, yes, did involve burning down the White House, even though we didn't burn down the White House. <laughs> but it is a big war in Canadiana. And it involves a lot of, you know, the first prime minister or the second prime minister, it's a lot of those stories. And the stories that we would meet and talk about were not those stories. We would meet and go like, hey, did you hear that this, you know, this indigenous woman created this thing and nobody knows and, and so on and so forth. So we thought, and you can jump in at any time, uh, we thought, why don't we try and start a podcast because development, as you all know, of doing a play is like five years, you do it, five people come, and <laughs> you say a prayer and put it in your drawer, and you know. Um, and so we thought, well, maybe podcasting, it seems successful, we could, we could, you know, put out a couple episodes pretty fast and see if anyone responds to them. And so we took a, a workshop with a, a podcast producer um, who works on a lot of podcasts in Canada. And immediately after, she asked us, it was a two-hour workshop, we did a little promo there. She asked us, can I produce your podcast? And we said, thank God, yes. <laughs> and uh, so we put out the first episode. The first episode, like Joanna said, was on Banff. And it's a place that especially the art community in Canada goes to. There's a retreat there, an artist center. And I, I grew up in Alberta. And Banff is a, a place of magic for Canada. And the thing about Banff, though, is it was created, it was essentially built by uh, internees. The Canadian government interned um, basically uh, Canadian citizens who were of European descent, uh, German and Ukrainian descent during World War I, and they put them to work creating our Canadian park system. So people died there, they built the roads, it was, it was perilous. Not only that, but um, uh, the indigenous people that uh, lived in Banff and uh, surrounded the area were kicked off the land, fenced off, prevented. They basically had um, pa park passes to get into their land to pick medicines or do any ceremony. And um, for years were not allowed into Banff, uh, except for one day, which was an Indian day. And they would be paraded out, tourists would take pictures. And so that <coughs> is Banff's history. And um, so we released this episode, and our producer said, I, you know, for a Canadian podcast, indie, it's going to be about 2,000 at the most people will listen to it, which we thought, cool. yes. Yeah. <laughs> people are going to listen to it. She said, but maybe it's only going to be 100. And I was like, 100 people? <laughs> Basically what happened is half a million people uh, downloaded that episode. <laughs> and, uh, and so it quickly became apparent to us that this history that we thought was maybe only interesting to the people we had been telling these stories in, in the theater realm, it turns out that it was a lot more interesting and Canadians did have an appetite to hear, um, you know, how history has really been re revised. Um, and so that's the podcast. Yeah. yeah, and I think Canada 150 did us a ginormous favor of happening when we did our podcast. <laughs> Let's just say it happened that way. <laughs> but because it, it gave Canadians a different frame of reference, like there was a, a, a definite, because the backlash to Canada 150 was so large, um, at least in, in the indigenous community, and I think Canadians started to question a little bit more and so I think 
that really did give us a bit of a, the door opened a crack and so we got to sneak through and then say all these things. Mm -hmm. uh, and people were more, their ears were more receptive to hearing those things I found as opposed to doing it. Like you could never, I don't think we would get away with this like maybe even five years ago. Mm -hmm. I think it, the impact and the yeah. listenership would be much smaller. And maybe, maybe I don't need to explain, but usually if you mention that you're doing a project about Canadian history, people's eyes kind of close <laughs> <laughs> over. Not interested. <laughs> not interested. So, which I always found really ironic because I think there's so much fascinating history that we just don't know about. And it's always, you hear these stories and you're like, why, why didn't I know this? Yeah. Why wasn't I taught this in school? Why didn't I know this fascinating history that somehow lost or buried or forgotten? Mm -hmm. I think, honestly, I know more probably about American history yeah. and British history mm -hmm. um, than I do, I mean, now that's changed, but that's what I learned in, in uh, elementary, junior high, and, and high school. Our, it was always framed as how we are perceived by these other countries and how they shaped us, and less about how we shaped ourselves and, and, and what we're doing. And this building is a perfect example of how things are changing. So Toronto is a, as you may have noticed, um, a city of glass, and a beautiful city that I love that bulldozes and tears down um, any sort of <laughs> any sort of brick building that has any bit of history or beauty. <laughs> I'm not there, but I'm not there. And usually what happens is they build something up and they call it the like Rexall Center or the corporate name here center. And this building, which is very new, this is a very new development. It's only been here two, three years now. Um, this is named uh, the Lucy, uh, Thornton and Lucy Blackburn Center, and they are uh, escaped slaves from the U.S. They came from Kentucky, uh, went through Detroit. There's a huge amount of history, I won't go into all of it, but they finally made it to Toronto. And they lived kind of over, over there, I can't really <laughs> explain where, but they lived over there kind of at the, at the corner of Cherry Street, there's a school there and they started a cab company after they escaped. And it was the first cab in Toronto, um, and then they got more cabs and more cabs, and eventually those horse and buggies turned into cars. And um, Thornton painted them red and yellow, and they were really well known in Toronto. And when the Toronto Transit Commission decided to build subways and build public transit, they painted it red and yellow because everyone knew Thornton's cab company, and they, they knew that's public transit, that's what's gonna read as public transit. And Thornton and Lucy became millionaires. They were well regarded in their community. There was a huge community of uh, escaped African Americans and African Canadians who settled here, and the Irish also, who were also basically like black people at the time. Um, meaning nobody wanted them around. Um, <laughs> so they all lived in this area. So this is it's a really interesting area. And so when this building built, and they called it the Thornton and Lucy Blackburn Center, I was like, what? <laughs> so it, it shows me how things are changing and how things, it's, it's amazing that they would name a building after, after them. It's great. Yeah. So maybe that goes into, sorry. No. No, I'm like, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry, what's the question? It's like, people need to know. Everyone just went boom. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Leah. Yeah. I mean, I think the question was, why don't we know these stories? I, I think, uh, I don't, part of it is denial. Uh, denial of history. It's an ugly history. You know, like, I think in, 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 uh, in America, the genocide <laughs> of indigenous people was done uh, through bullets and killing pretty overtly, uh, war was different. We have paper war. Uh, those wars are both going on. I think America definitely has taken on more of a paper war now, but those wars still happen. Uh, and I think there's something about that, uh, the influence of the British on us and our politeness, our polite genocide. <laughs> um, I think that's part of it. I think there is, but if we don't embrace those things, like one, we're not interesting. Like let's just embrace those things that are, are the true history of what happened here because we need to know those to be better and to move forward and we also need to know those things so that we don't do it again and it's interesting history like canadian history is interesting history um it's just not the history that's presented in the textbooks that you're getting um 
which I mean for the most part is bullshit anyway, right? <laughs> like, yeah, and we've gotten a lot of feedback from the podcast, and mostly positive, but a, a, a lot of the negative feedback is you have, we, we do have a tone in our podcast, we do have opinions, um, and we, we do make a lot of jokes because it's hard history and it, it's, it's hard to get through and that's how we talk about it. So it wasn't, it wasn't like we were, you know, trying to, it wasn't a prescribed way of being for us, but it's easier to get through when you can take a break and tell some Britney Spears jokes and then jump back into <laughs> genocide. Um, but, uh, so I was making, um, well, maybe we could go into yeah. a bit of the process of it. how, how you do it. How, how do you choose the stories? How do you, how we do have you a lot, story? like a lot of our, we invite the listeners to write in and suggest things. So we definitely have like a stack of those, mm -hmm. like there is no shortage. Uh, there are so many internet holes to fall down these days that like we'll be looking at one thing and then all of a sudden we'll be over here looking at a different thing. So then that idea gets banked and then we'll be going this way and then we find something else and that idea gets banked. And so we try to keep track of all of those things. But once we find one that we really want to hold on to, then the research really begins. Um, and so that's, we go to the reference a lot. Yeah, the uh, reference library in Toronto is Yes, cool. the reference library in Toronto is really uh, big and expansive. And you know, the other week or the other month we had a, a book from was it 1914? Yeah. Does Never it opened. No one had ever taken it out. <gasps> oh god, it was so and it had a twig on it. It had a little oh. twig on the front, this little detail and it was about the national park system because we're looking at that more right now. Mm -hmm. And you know, no gloves, no nothing. You just like flip through it and it tells you all about Canadian like the Canadian park system uh, and why it was being built and you know what the uh, mandate of it was. And so we spent a lot of time there um, and talking to people. For me, um, like I'm working on one on the Yukon right now, so the first thing I did was email Yvette, <laughs> my friend Yvette over there, <laughs> and say, because she lived in the Yukon, and I was like, who should I talk to? So a lot of that, it's like, uh, we call it, uh, we call it uh, mocks and telegraph. So it's <laughs> like we talk to each other so that we know we're talking to the right people and that I'm getting the, like I want to, specifically for me, I want to get the indigenous foundations of that place and I want to make sure that I'm talking to the right people. So I called a bunch of friendship centers, different cultural centers, spoke to uh, as many people as I could, sent emails to as many people as I could. Sometimes people answer you, sometimes they don't, sometimes they want to talk, sometimes they do not. Um, and then, you know, and then Lee and I put it in a Google Doc, we start scripting it and passing it back and forth. Um, yeah, I think it's, I mean, for us, it's how do we, how do we extract, first of all, when you're looking, especially in history textbooks and history books, it's like reading, reading through the material almost, like you read the material and then you go like, what's behind this material? So it's often like, such and such, sir, such and such did all of these things and his wife was also there, and so I always <laughs> heard, who was his who was his wife, and what was she doing, and you know, like it's it's reading between the lines. So it is it is um, it it takes a lot of time, and I think because the project is really about changing the lens and changing the frame, it's about looking at as many sources as possible. So. Um, you know, I try to read at least three, if not five, of the same story from a, a different different voices, and then try and filter that to what is the actual what's the actual story here, and um, yeah. But I have to say, one of the the, the biggest thing about this process um, that is interesting is how scary it is to work with history. Um, because we realize, you know, it's not just about putting together a script and making a funny podcast, even though that is part of what we do, but it is um, feeling a huge responsibility to the groups that we're telling. Because I think the, the one of the things that you said to me was like somebody had asked you, you know, we get a lot of just colleagues say like, hey, Leah, um, do you know any black people or whatever? <laughs> Like, hey, Phelan, do you know, uh, like, a Cree person or whatever? And it's like, well, we, you know how we know is we, 
went out and did the work. And we did, we're not born knowing this information. We have to do the work and we have to read and we have to do the research. So why don't you do that? <laughs> um, I've gotten off topic again. I'm trying. But I think, um, I think that's in, like I think that's important that we do position ourselves not as historians. Yeah. yeah. Um, we uh, we position ourselves as curious people, and I think that's really important because the knowledge is accessible. The reference library is a public building. Um, <laughs> like these these stories um, do exist, and it's re it's not that hard to find them if you just dig a little bit. And so I think for me that's a big part of it as well, is inviting people to be curious about this place that we live in and what happened here. Mm -hmm. And I think you're not only going to the historical records, to the libraries, you're, you're reaching out to communities, right? So in a lot, of, a lot of cases, these stories are known in specific communities. Like, I happen to know about the Banff Mm -hmm. um, internment right. camps because yeah. my grandfather was part of one during second. Anyway, but it's yes. So her grandfather was part of an internment camp in the Second World War. That's what she just glossed over. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so that kind of history is known in in yes. these particular communities, and so you're not only referencing the books and the textbooks and things like that. You're actually talking to people and yeah. getting their side of the story, and which I think is also a really lovely. Um, in addition to your humor and your personalities and your, you're very charming when you explain these things, it's also people who don't, usually aren't a part of the story we hear about Canadian history, telling their own story. Yeah, and it's weird because I think it is part of that, I mean, one thing I would say that is a stereotype about Canadians that might be true is um, the, the modesty, and I think it, it plays out in different forms, and one of one of that is that we're telling our stories in our communities and not maybe as much out right so you had the story about your grandfather um and the ukrainian community which i grew up around i had no idea that these internment camp camps happened and it you know reverberated throughout uh generations um and so the podcast is really about pushing out those those stories um <coughs> Because Canada, in our history, we like to, we really like to promote the stories that make us look good, mm -hmm. and we don't have any sort of r real critical um, conversations about the stories that don't make us look good. And I really feel as a country, just like like as a person, to get better, you have to look at your your flaws and go like, how can I how can I work on those and make them better? I think we have to do that as a country. And so that's, you know, the Secret Life of Canada is really for me a love letter to Canada. Even though we call out Canada, most episodes, um, we criticize Canada a lot. I feel like for me it is. Um, uh, that's the relationship. Yeah, it's like a boyfriend. You just want him to get better. He's going to work on himself. <laughs> but in this scenario, we want to stay together. We don't want you to break up with us and then marry the next girl yeah. right after. <laughs> you want the work in. Even though you said you'd never get married. <laughs> Part of it is you do celebrate it. I mean, the episode talking about the snacks or the foods mm -hmm. of Canada, which I think was, you know, a lovely, just, it was, you know, some could say frivolous, but I learned a lot about this country through the history of butter tarts and through the history of poutine. Like, you know, it's. Yeah, we wanted to do um, some lighter episodes because we do really heavy material. Um, the the episode that we did last month was uh, on the statues, the most popular statues in Canada, um, because uh, one of our mandates of the podcast is really to to promote the untold and undertold stories of Canada, and that meant not telling the prime minister's stories, not telling the general's stories. We've heard enough of those, but more and more people said, "Can you actually tell the full story of these men? Because they're not." We only hear the good stuff. So we we did that episode, which was really hard to get through and, and really difficult material. It's actually quite a funny episode. And so we counterbalanced that with episodes about snacks. We did an episode about feminism, but we framed it all through this one book uh, that won a Governor General's 
Literary Award, which is a very esteemed award here in Canada, called Bear. Um, it, it, it was published in 1976, and it's about a woman who has a sexual relationship with a bear. And um, that, that was a really fun episode to do, and people really responded to bear sex. <laughs> cartilaginous sheath are like forever burned <laughs> in my head. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, on the other side of that, like we do do some, like the, uh, the majority of the, like yeah, if we're being funny. real, the majority of the episodes do have a heavy undertone. And so it was something that I think we sort of struggled, like we, I don't know, not struggled. I think we found it pretty quickly, but it was something that I know I definitely felt internally a struggle with like, well, how jokey can we be and how serious, like how do we keep them listening without having them turn off and then also like what is the dramaturgical like arc of this of this thing right like how do we how do we keep the audience um, and how do how does that story become cohesive but it does you know it costs these stories cost mm -hmm. you know there's it's hard to know all these things at a certain point so I understand why uh, the majority of you know, my many Canadians don't know this because it's a hard history, and it, and it definitely has torn a strip off us at points. Like, yeah, Ipperwash damn near broke me, and that was only episode two. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's it's really hard. Um, but I think that's the same with you know a lot of in, t in terms of theater, there are plays that cost a lot, right? I think. There's sometimes, I think, uh, most of the time after you finish writing one or working on one, you walk away and you are changed. Mm -hmm. And I feel, I definitely feel that there is something akin to that in this project. Well, let's, let's talk about that. So you're both playwrights, you're both performers, producers. Um, what, are the, what are the skills you use as podcasters or what are the things you had to get better at or learn to do to do this? Yeah, I mean, the uh, the funny thing is um, we've met a lot of Canadian media people now and they all say like, how do you have these skills? Like, how how how, how are you doing this? And honestly, it's playwriting, it's theater. This The podcast, that is what it is. Um, it wasn't a huge stretch for us to, to do it. I think um, one of the, the main differences between doing a podcast and uh, doing theater is um, in a theater, mostly they can't leave. I know they can, but in Canada, they mostly do not leave. Um, they're very polite here. And so podcasts, they will turn it off. So we had to figure out how to develop a way of getting out the history and then almost doing a mini break for the audience like do two minutes of history and then a break and two more minutes of history and then a break because that's our our attention span now right people don't have a, a huge attention span to listen to this kind of material so that was an interesting thing to develop and so that's what we do with our scripts we we put in all the history and then we try and kind of put an s through it with comedy and ridiculousness so people will stay with us is that is that improvised is that scripted i mean like when you hear the show it sounds like you guys are you know mm -hmm. just geniuses just genius. yeah, I know. <laughs> no, scripted totally scripted um which i felt scared to admit to people at first i was like no i'm just that smart um, but uh, well i'm not <laughs> i'll only speak for myself <laughs> No, it's scripted, like facts, dates, history, because again, we have a huge responsibility to tell the story that's already been told wrong, to tell it better. And so we attempt, like we have to script it, and then we have things written in the script that like, I'll make a joke for Leah, and then in brackets I'll say, or something better. Mm -hmm. And that'll, and then she can come into the Google Doc and like write her joke, or she can say, well, what about this here? And so we, there are, it's usually the jokey bits that are the, off script. If we're having like a particularly goofy day, then like sometimes I'll just, I'll have to be reined in. <laughs> yeah, the jokes we do improvise, we'll know the section that we improvise and talk, but everything else is scripted and it, it yeah, we can't go off that script because it's history and um, we don't want to get um, letters, you know. But it is having like, it is having the training as actors and performers and, and people who have to speak publicly to be able to lift off the page. Mm -hmm. Like, 
you know, being able to have that thing in front of you or the screen in front of you and lift it um, on your first try, you know. And part of our process is also, there's one lead person who writes the script. So Phelan will write a script and when she's ready, I will basically go in and dramaturge her script and I'll go, this doesn't make sense or I don't understand this part. Um, especially when we're telling stories that are closer to ourselves, like any playwright, sometimes I go, I know this makes sense to you, but you need to break it down like in very, um, you know, very clear for this audience because they're not going to have all the context that we have. So sometimes it feels a bit simplified that we have to really simplify the history, but, um, you know, learning very quickly that how many schools are using this podcast, um, how many um, kids listen to the podcast, we, we feel a big responsibility to make it clear and kind of digestible. And you should also mention on, on the website are show notes for every single episode where your sources are documented, you've got more information, there's web links, so, so I think it's, it's clear that, you know, we're not just, you're not just pulling this <laughs> out of the air. For, for episodes one to four, when we had, um, we had uh, money. money and sponsorship, <laughs> there was somebody doing that, but we don't do that anymore because of time. Yeah, so people... But we hope to, like, you know, we hope at some mm -hmm. point we'll be able to get that happening again. But the lesson was, so in podcasting, what they always tell you is do show notes. You need to have a website where they do show notes. Um, nobody reads the show notes. <laughs> That's what we've, we've learned and we've been told from other podcasters that people just don't, don't go in. So this is, this is how it's this intimate like relationship that people are getting this information. And then, yeah. Great. Um, I think we're gonna open it up to questions mm -hmm. now. Um, Yes. Oh, okay. Can you talk more, more about what you've learned in terms of form? This is an audio form. Mm -hmm. um, as you've gone in being storytellers, being people with a theater background, which is a seeing place, what is, what is the podcast world? And that's, you we're talking about the intimacy with this audio. What have you learned about the audio form? That Leah does a really good American man accent. <laughs> <laughs> She'll show it to you later. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> no. I love her American man. <laughs> Good. Yeah, we do. But we do care. We do. We do, we do like we. You know, we'll make each other do things to help to help sort of create. Um, you know, world. yeah, to create the world, to create interesting things with music and you know accents. Sometimes terrible, terrible accents. <laughs> um, but to, yeah, to help build that world. Uh, one of the things that we also learned really early on was how to because I think we're used to writing stage directions, but to write. You know the you know the lake of this place is this color, and the dunes of here are like this, and the trees are deciduous. Or you know, like you have to learn to to say your stage directions, which was the thing that was like, oh yeah, we have to describe the place so that they can see it in their head. Yeah, Th those were some of the first things that I learned. Yeah, learning how to make a, a historical quote jump off the page. How do we? And so we found the best way to do that for people was to put some music underneath it and do the character. Even though it felt a bit ridiculous, people really responded to us doing men. <laughs> we basically just do a lot of, you know, of male. Yeah. Well, you know, women, yeah. women's stories were written down. Yeah, so well, not a lot of, we play a lot of men. Yeah. <laughs> there was a question. Yes. Uh, after a half a million listeners, is pretty high. <laughs> Still not sure. Uh, no. <laughs> well, I mean, we were we were being funded at that time, so we did have a little bit of support, but not like they weren't pushing it much. They really didn't anticipate that the project would be as successful as it was, which in some ways worked to our advantage later on, um, because we we got to be a surprise, right? And how great is that? I think one of the things is we released the first episode over a long weekend. Um, uh, Labor Day weekend. Was it Labor Day? Yep. Yes. Yeah. And that's a weekend where people leave the city and they listen to radio and podcasts and they and so I think because it was released over that weekend, people started sharing it because that weekend it went from not being on the iTunes charts to being on it to being number two. We About did, Oprah. 
it was above Oprah, and but not American above life. and this American Life, yeah, but not Joe. But not Joe Rogan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, I don't know. It, it actually was quite organic. Yeah. Yes. I'm curious about how you work with duration because there seems like there's a lot of freedom with podcast world where you can actually um, figure out how you want to tell a story and where where stories. Uh, beginning and end are and so are you is there, is there more freedom in duration for you guys in terms of the work that you're doing and how does that influence your thoughts about playwriting and performance perhaps um, we have a pretty strict policy of 40 minutes and under um, because uh, I have no attention span. Like personally, I, I try and create things that I want to listen to, and so I, I can't listen to a podcast. <laughs> <that's> like, <laughs> yeah. I can't listen that's to amazing. things that are super super long. Personally, go um, <laughs> 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 so to do, do it. Everybody, go <laughs> down and <laughs> subscribe. <laughs> um, yeah, so we try and keep it. Forty minutes would be a long one. We try to keep it between thirty and forty because we just don't feel a lot of people really can sustain. I mean, there are podcasts that are like two hours long. People listen to them in increments, but it's really important the stories that we tell that you hear the full beginning to end. Um, and that's also because personally, I can't do like a three act play now. Ooh, that's hard for me to get through. It's gotta be really, Amazing with a bar. With a bar. Max. Ironically, I am writing a three act thing right now. <laughs> I'm working, ironically, I'm working on an opera that is three acts. Um, that is an adaptation, so I, I shouldn't have said that. But, uh, uh, but yeah, I just think that's, that's we just want to make it as uh, digestible for people. And you also do these. Teasers, would you call them? They're, they're kind of mini episodes, they're like yeah. mini shout outs. Mm -hmm. So are those like just trying to get as many stories in as possible or? Well, I think, I mean, it serves a bunch of purposes. It gets us to, you know, we do these smaller, shorter episodes. So they're usually like, like three to four minutes long. Um, sometimes a little bit shorter than that. And they're about people, uh, usually people um, who have either done something important in Canadian history or consider themselves Canadian or live in this place called Canada. And so uh, those, those are just to, yeah, to get more information out, to tell those stories, uh, but also in the world of podcasting and digital media, which we're learning about every day, uh, is about content and how content is key, right? And to maintain generating content and to keep things going and to keep your feed active because that keeps people coming back and keeps people listening if they know that there will frequently, you know, twice a month is what we do, there'll be something new to listen to. Mm -hmm. So there's sort of a practical and, you know, a, a content reason for that. Yeah, we do other things so we can't, we're not one of those podcasts that we do once a week. We basically do it twice a month and one is a short shout out and one is a longer episode. Yeah. Uh, I guess in the back. So, um, um, sort of ripping off what Ken asked you, but also looking at you as producers, as writers, and as performers. And clearly you don't have the Brothers Grimm problem where you gather in the stories and one wants to censor them and one doesn't. So you sound pretty like-minded. And yet I find most podcasts that have a team, that there's some kind of differentiation and they play against and off of each other. Do you have that creative tension vibe that you're different? And does that determine who does which impersonation? Mm. <laughs> I think, no, I think we're pretty like-minded. Yeah. We have to push work off on each other. I'm like, you do it, you do it, you do it. Yeah. She does like, too. You'll get the script and then all of a sudden they'll be like, all right, like, Leah sings. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, Phelan gives her current opinion on Justin Trudeau and the Canadian government, or whatever, right? Four hours later. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're lucky that we yeah. work really well together. The only thing is, I think, like, sometimes my jokes get a bit dirty because of the kid. Lee is very aware of the kids, and so my jokes, <laughs> yeah. sometimes my jokes have to go. Sometimes I fight for them to stay. It's funny, in the, in the beginning, I swore a lot. I was like, let's 
take everyone to task and I swore a lot and then people were like my nine-year-old just listen to your podcast and I was like okay let's censor ourselves <laughs> um, uh, I think the, the reason our podcast works is because I'm a first-generation Canadian so I come in with that frame of mind and that Phelan is an indigenous and so when we're storytelling I try when she is um, building this uh, framework of um, indig indigenous storytelling in each episode, I try to um, fr frame myself as the, the, the average Canadian that doesn't know anything. Because most of the stories that we find, I had no idea. So I, it's not coming from a place of pretending. Usually I'm researching and going, I have no, I have no idea. And I think that's another reason people connect to the podcast because even though we take the government um, and basically a lot of the Canadian people to task, uh, we do say throughout like, oh, I have no idea. Did you have any idea? Yeah. So we're not accusatory in saying to the audience, you should have known this as well and you should feel bad. It's like we all didn't know. Um, and so I think that's why the relationship on, on, on air works. Yeah. That makes sense. I think it's also important to note that we, we met working at a theater company in administration roles. We worked, we met working at Native Earth Performing Arts, so Lee already had a good foundation, and I was like, she's good people. Um, but there's this, there's this idea, there's this thing that we get emails constantly about people saying, can you just do um, an indigenous one? Just do an indigenous one that tells me everything. <laughs> no. <laughs> And so when we try, that's like a big part of the starting place. It's like whatever place we're in, we're like, okay, well, who was there first? Who were the first people who were in that area? Can we trace to, what history can we trace there? And then we start there. So in, you know, I think by the very, um, by the fact that we, you know, we start in that place, every episode is an Indigenous episode. For me. Mm -hmm. It is. Yeah, and I, uh, we, we should say that Yvette Nolan, who's sitting here, who's the former artistic director of Native Earth, is really responsible for this podcast because she hired me and she was very generous. I was hired at Native Earth to be an outreach coordinator when I moved to Toronto. I knew zero about <laughs> Indigenous history and that was my job was to create um, uh, like uh, the show, what do you call it? I can't like, a, uh, like study, guide? study guides. And so I'd be sitting in the office and be like, everyone, this is all Indigenous people. Did you guys know residential school lasted till like the 80s? And they'd be like, yeah, we knew <laughs> And so that generosity that they gave to me, that's what we try to imbue in the podcast. Yeah, like, so, yeah. It's not okay shaming, it's not, it's not about, it's okay to not know because how would you know? Yeah. Like it's very, it's sometimes very well hidden and some of it's just coming to light. And so it's not about, how dare you not know this? You're a racist. <laughs> it's not about that. It's about really for us. It's 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 about sharing this because we feel really passionately about this stuff, and and we want to make something where somebody goes, I don't know anything about this. I want to know something about this. Oh, there's this. I'll listen to this, and then I'll know something about it. Have you gotten any flack for you know the different tack you've taken on you know the history that? Yeah, you can read our iTunes reviews. <laughs> yeah, if you want, if you want to hear some some native woman, yeah. Or like, yeah. If you don't like it here, go back. Yeah, to there's where a you're lot from. of like, go back, go back to where you're from. And I'm yeah. like, Barbados is beautiful, and <laughs> I'll go anytime. <laughs> <laughs> that's fine. That's fine. Um, yeah, I mean, there are people. Yes, we we get a lot of of negative feedback, but. I don't care so much about it. Yeah. Well, it's surprising. I, I don't really. We should just have a vet up here, because uh, <laughs> a vet said, "Well, if you weren't pissing people off, you wouldn't be doing it right." Yeah. Right. <laughs> like if we were making everyone happy, then we would definitely be doing something very wrong. And that history is really an opinion. It's always been opinionated. It's always been told through someone with a. Um, a perspective and a mindset and so this is our perspective and mindset and if you want to find that information somewhere else you're welcome you know a podcast is a free thing we certainly don't make anyone listen to it um, 
except our family. <laughs> because we're theater people and that's what you do. You force your family to the house. Any other, any questions? This must be an important one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes. I'm caught by, first thank you for what you've already shared with us today. Uh, I'm caught by your statement about the heaviness of the stories, that the historical stories that you start out with, and the ways that you lace them with deliberate comedy to help your audience through the heavy lifting. <coughs> that means that you as the makers have to do the heavy lifting without that. So, so how, what are some of the strategies you discovered to keep yourselves going, keep yourselves healthy while you're taking that full impact mm -hmm. on back end thing? Yes. We did shots that one time. <laughs> But I mean, but it was more than that, right? Mm -hmm. um, but it was more than that. I think we realized very early on, I think it was Ipper Wash, because I, like, I was really busted. I busted myself, which is a thing that I think many of us understand. It happens, like you hurt yourself by taking on the responsibility of a story that is so big and so painful and so hard to tell that, and you feel such a great responsibility to do it right and beholden to the people that you're speaking about that you can bust yourself. Um, and so I think when we were about to record, after, I think it was after we recorded Ipper Wash, Leah brought a bottle of rum from, Barbados. from Barbados yeah. and these little tiny Canadian shot glasses and after we were done recording we all just like looked at each other and said, you know, like let's take care of each other and then we did a shot. <laughs> um, but I think it's, you know, it's like those, it's the ceremonies that we make, we're careful with each other. We try to work in person more and not be so satellite so that we aren't so isolated because writing is very isolating and especially when you're telling these big hard stories and you sometimes get lost in your head. So I think, yeah, like, you know, and it's also about turning off, um, which, you know, I think and doing the things that, like for me, I like to cook and I really like to make time for myself just to do something with my hands where I'm not looking at a screen and it's about tactile stuff, you know? I think it's just like any other kind of art form that you need to break from because it can get hard and heavy. Yeah, I think I've realized because I was pretty much crying every episode. <laughs> like not on, not while we were recording, but I would take a break and cry and then be like, okay, da 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 da, -da you know, like, <laughs> let's do makeup. And so I realized like I needed to get that out before we recorded so that I was, doing the best for this community, whoever we're talking about, and getting out the story. Um, so I try and let it go before we record, but sometimes it's hard, especially when you're doing things, you know, we have accelerated schedules where we'll have to record a couple all at once. Um, the statues, the one that we just did on statues was really hard for me. I don't know why. Well, I know why. Yeah. It was, well, the history was really hard. but. Um, I think when, when I'm really discovering new information for the first time or it's about, yeah, it, it's hard to get through. So that, that one, yeah, so Phelan just like would watch me cry and be like, okay, ready for another one? Yeah, we go into it. But we're still navigating that for sure. Yeah. Is there a question over here? Yeah. Um, so you mentioned that the first four episodes you had some funding for, so how are you keeping it going and how, how can people support you? We have a Patreon. <laughs> and so, yeah, it's on our website. Um, uh, yeah, if you Google us, we're on Twitter. Yeah, it's Instagram. also in the links to all that. Yeah, so. yeah, so, uh, yeah, we have a Patreon uh, that covers some of it. It's not much, but at this point, like, it's hard to not, I mean, we, we, we're not putting it down. We're going to keep going because it's, because there's a desire for it. Like we did a talk uh, in Waterloo a couple of months, I don't even know when that was, like a month or two ago, and uh, <coughs> this mother brought her kid. <laughs> they drove from uh, Dundas, Ontario, so like not too far, probably about an hour. And the little girl, she had such a great question. She was like, where do you find your sources? She was like, so if you're not finding these, you know, standard sources, where are you finding your sources? She was 12. Um, and we were like, great question. I let you answer that. I was like, oh, I've got some excitement. <laughs> yeah. It's difficult. Yeah. It, it, it was. <laughs> um, and so, because she's young, she's a young person. And, and so afterwards she came up to us and I guess her mom was homeschooling her. 
Uh, and they saw that we were going to be there, so they drove out, and she was really excited. And they used the show as part of their curriculum. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So those kinds of like that's uh, although it's an immense pressure, it's like also really uh, a satisfying pressure to have put on you to know that there's a there's a change, and I can be optimistic <laughs> about the world, knowing that if this history goes out into the world, then there are young people who are soaking it up, and they're going to make this place better. That's my hope, anyway. Okay, yes. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that about the, the young girl that asked about your sources, because I was curious if you have a favorite um, tool or resource that you find yourself going to over and over to, to really dig into this history. I, I find, well, it, it varies. Like, like Phelan said, I try to find a source that's closest to the community that we're dealing with, right? So there are a lot of Canadian history um, resources put out by the Canadian government, and those are very helpful. Thank you. Thank you for downloading. I know, right? I love it. <laughs> I love it. This is the second time. <laughs> Um, uh, well, this is a new episode out right now. Year. Oh, really? Right oh, now. Oh, yeah. Good. <laughs> yes. How did you do that? Yeah, just while we're here. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, the Canadian government has a lot of resources, uh, but I, but I always try and find the book or the website by the community, especially if it's a uh, Inuit community or First Nation or you know the Filipino community, whoever it is. I find actually a lot of times when we're doing a culturally specific community, I find their like cultural association web page. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I always start with like these like rinky web pages that's like the blah 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 association, and I look through all of their material and then I go from there because that's the I want the the main source. Yeah, like I call uh, I call the I call the cultural center in Dawson City to talk to them. And I'll, most people are like, yeah, let's talk. And then they'll either email you a list of sources or like, oh, that book was published by us in our small community, but I have a PDF, I think I'll send it to you. And then you'll get this PDF of this book that doesn't really exist outside of the Yukon and you're like, amazing. Um, for the Inuit, for the North episode that we wrote, so that deals with Canada's North, which was a huge learning curve for me, I think, as it was for most, as it is for most Canadians. The North, I think, is one of our most misunderstood, and uh, it's just, we don't know a lot about it. Um, the average person living in Canada doesn't know much about the North. And so, I went to a cultural competency training, a two-day training session where I sat there, and they gave me history, and I got to speak to an elder, and. So it's like just keeping your eye out for those kinds of opportunities. I like to look at the National Film Board website because they have films going back, you know, to like the late 60s and 70s. And so there's something about just seeing footage of places and people in a time that helps put me in the mindset. Um, documentaries, if I can find them, are a nice, easy way. Uh, or sometimes I think easy, and then I just have like pages and pages of notes to go through. Um, but also like, the library has been, it's a place that I didn't really visit much until, like I did when I was in school, and then when I was, you know. The reference, the Toronto, Toronto reference, reference library, library is They've pretty been, good. Yeah. Uh, the Jesuit archives um, are pretty um, terrifying. It, yeah, and, and, yeah, and it, it's been interesting how generous people have been to us to have the conversation. Um, really early on, I didn't want to try to phone anyone. Like, are they even, you know, you say you're doing a podcast, like, okay, everyone has a podcast. But um, uh, people have been really generous. We did an episode on Birchville, Nova Scotia, which is, N Nova Scotia is really uh, one of the areas that a lot of African Americans uh, came to or were brought to. Um, and so there's a huge African Canadian community there. And, um, you know, I got to talk to Lawrence Hill, who wrote the Book of Negroes, who, I mean, that, that book is really about that area and that time and place, and his parents are both scholars. He was very generous, um, not only talking to me, but then being like, okay, check out this link. If you ever need anything again, I'm like, are you busy? Like, you're really doing so much, but thank you. So, yeah, like, there are experts out there in all of this stuff. It's just that we don't come across 
their work in a consumable way. And so those people generally are pretty excited to talk about their work, their, sometimes their life's work, and have it uh, put out into the world in a bigger way. And especially, you know, if we do get to interview them and we can accredit it to them, that's, like, that's the bonus. So I think we have time for one more question. Any burning questions out there? Okay. Yes. Um, so it seems like a delightful rabbit hole of research excitement um, that could take you in like a bunch of different directions and change your narrative ideas and just sort of blow up the whole, a whole like, premise for a podcast. So I'm just wondering practically, like how long it takes you to research something and sort of like how you bring that in when you find things that are deviating from the topic you're looking at. Yes. It depends. <laughs> I mean, it depends. Like I think sometimes things have to happen faster than I want them to, mm -hmm. um, but they have to happen. So you know, a lot of the time, the, I think the the nice thing is that what we can say um, is, you know, this is uh, this is the history of this place. Um, we don't have time to tell you everything, so we've just grabbed these things that we want to tell you about. But we invite you to either like look at this book, or check out this website, or talk, or you know, read this person and you can learn more about it, but we've decided to talk about these things. Mm -hmm. And so that helps us, you know, if the, the time pressure is like, well, I really want to talk about this thing, but I'm not 100% sure about that fact, then we can leave it out knowing that, you know, hopefully that will either come back maybe later on in, you know, a shout out or another podcast, or we can at least sort of, you know, address some things about that place or person or thing. Best case scenario, it's usually about a month from beginning research to end but it's hard with us because we do because we've worked on so many plays about Canadian history we do have a lot of stuff in our back pocket where we go okay I remember this guy okay so we're gonna put him in and um, but about a month but we've done two weeks we've done a week that's hurt yeah. Um, <laughs> so yeah. that hurts yeah. yeah that hurts and it's also you know because we do have like other things <laughs> happening like work <laughs> um, <laughs> work that has to happen and so you know sometimes it's it's really it's, it can be a real crunch but uh, and there's you know stress and no sleep and mm -hmm. it's just like you know what you guys do mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> all right so what's the website so the website is secretlifecanada.com or .ca um, uh, or you can find us on iTunes or any of the portals. There's so many portals to get podcasts. Whatever it is, we're there. Um, I like that our web domain crosses borders. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> That's one that would probably get cut. <laughs>